So the first year that I taught Station Eleven, I was surprised by the number of students who said that they found the opening section, the theater, really harrowing, really intense. And I thought that wasn't my experience of it. I thought it was good. It was compelling. It made me want to keep reading. By all means, it's a page turner. But I found myself at odds with these students and, and wasn't quite sure why. And over the years that I've taught this novel again and again, I've recognized that there is a, is a, there's a group of students who come to Station Eleven with no other experience of apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic narratives. And consequently, the book feels more intense than it would for someone who has been weaned on a steady diet of, say, The Walking Dead. And the, a student might find themselves at odds as well with the statement from Maximilian Feldner's article, Survival is Insufficient, the Post-Apocalyptic Imagination of Emily St. John Mandel's Station Eleven, where he says that Station Eleven presents an unusually optimistic and hopeful vision of an otherwise bleak future. They might look at that and say, well, that's not the experience that I had of the theater. The theater was intense. Uh, it, it felt really awful. The world was ending. There's, there's terrible things happening. And in help, wanting to help my students get beyond thinking that Emily St. John Mandel's opening is intense and suspenseful and it's just a real thrill ride, uh, I wanted to put it in conversation with another work that would contrast in a way that would illuminate how someone like Feldner could be saying that this book presents an unusually optimistic and hopeful vision of an otherwise bleak future. And granted, at this point in the book, we're not really looking at the future. We're just looking at this initial moment. But even there, I don't really think that what Mandel presents to us is particularly bleak. So we contrast it, even just at the level of paratexts to begin with, by looking at the cover of Station Eleven again, the North American uh, trade paperback cover with the uh, tents and the wall, the very sort of quiet, peaceful, serene, with this uh, uh, landscape with this beautiful starry sky above it. And then we contrast that with the marketing strategies, the paratexts, the promotional posters for Contagion with, you know, we look at the expressions of the faces of the actors being featured here and everyone looks like the world is ending. They've got world ending looks on their faces, right? Matt Damon's holding his hand out to stop something. Lawrence Fishburne's on the phone. He's looking intense. Marion Cotillard is looking over her, her shoulder. Something's going on, right? There's an intensity to their faces. And then we just, right away, there's this, this slogan, nothing spreads like fear. Nothing spreads like fear. And I chose Contagion because it arguably, and here we get to review that concept that we looked at last time, of story versus narrative, it arguably tells the same story that the theater in Station Eleven does. That these two narratives are telling the same story. A story being an event or a series of events, and a narrative being a representation of those events or series of events. And so we can say that the story that Station Eleven in the theater and Contagion are both telling is the story of an outbreak of a pandemic flu. That's what both of these narratives are. That's the story that both these narratives are telling. So um, we've got the story, outbreak of a pandemic flu, and these are not the only instances of this either. Next week, we're going to look at another instance of an outbreak of a pandemic flu, uh, another narrative of that in Stephen King's prologue to The Stand. So we get these, you know, the, the overlap between story and narrative where we have explicitly presented events. So you can say, well, the story is the outbreak of a pandemic flu and therefore they are the same. And that's sort of true. But there are a lot of significant differences between Station Eleven and Contagion. And we want to pay attention 
to those differences because differences can tell us a great deal. There's a, there's a religious scholar by the name of Jonathan Z. Smith, and he was always very interested in the difference a difference makes. And I'm very interested in the difference a difference makes. What differences do we find here? And how do they tell us something about the meaning or the potential effect that uh, these, the, these narratives have? So the overlap area, those explicitly presented events, that's where we really want to focus. Quite often, as readers, we, or readers or watchers, we're playing out in the zones of narrative and story beyond those explicitly presented events. And in the, you know, decade and some years that I've been teaching literature, um, I've found that it's really helpful to just focus on what's on the page and what's on the screen. And that's where we want to focus today. We want to start by looking at contagion because... I know that a lot of people learn to read a book in a critical and analytical way in high school. We're given tools to understand how to read the novel. But I find that it is less often that we are given the tools to understand how to read a film. And many people will just read a film as though it's a moving novel. And it's not for all sorts of reasons. First and foremost being its length. Uh, movies are not a long form. It's why whenever we adapt a novel to a film, so much content needs to be cut. Really, the television series allows for the, the, you know, the proper amount of time to match the breadth of a novel. So films are, uh, in, in many respects, a short form, though we often treat them as though they are a long form. But film has, film isn't, uh, and isn't like other things. Film is its own thing. It has its own, we might say grammar, we might say it has its own syntax, it has its own language ultimately. And I'm not talking about the dialogue of characters in a film. I'm talking about the five pieces of, of, of film language, which I've talked about before uh, on the podcast with my introduction to film course. But I want to give a crash course today in film language using contagion as the example. So these five elements are mise-en-scene, and that's a French term that means everything in the frame, though we can understand that perhaps as production design and costume design. Production design would, would, would cover the same sorts of things that mise-en-scene does, but not entirely. There's, there's some aspects to mise-en-scene that, that production design doesn't quite cover. Um, cinematography, how the, the, the elements that are in the mise-en-scene, the production design, the sets, the costumes, the bric-a-brac on, on a set that's you know, there to make it feel like a real space, uh, all of that is captured through the lens uh, of a camera. And it's the, it's the director of photography, who does that? And we call that art cinematography. There's editing, taking all of the footage that the cinematographer, the director of photography produces. Everything that's gone into the camera is then off, taken out and developed in the old days anyway. Now we just have digital, digital, digital. But all of that footage is then taken and chopped up, cut up, and strung back together by an editor to create a sense of uh, logical, coherent narrative or perhaps illogical, incoherent narrative if the point of the film is life is meaningless. Um, acting, we know a ton about acting. I leave acting down the line because the first thing most people talk about when it comes to film is the acting. And what I've learned over the years is that acting is just one facet of what makes films watchable, great, memorable, any of those things. Um, and then finally, sound. We don't, I don't think we consider sound in film enough, uh, it, but it does a ton of things. Uh, almost, and every one of these, in, in its own respect, acts in some respect uh, invisibly, except for acting. Acting is the one thing that we really see. Mise-en-scene uh, people do pick up on, but not as much as some other facets. I'm going to begin with editing, though, because the beginning of Contagion is a wonderful montage. It's a wonderful series of shots and cuts that give us an, an immense amount of narrative information in a very short space of time. Linton Davies, in a book called The Editing of Star Wars, says that editing is storytelling in the most efficient and engaging way possible. The final rewrite of the script, as it were, and it is difficult to extract 
what were specifically editing decisions in which were enforced by the shooting draft and its interpretation by the rest of the crew. Because sometimes a film will get a really great shot and they're like, we really want to put this in here, even if it wasn't in the original shooting script. And so we get really concise, but really efficient and engaging storytelling here at the beginning of the film where we're, we're jumping different places, uh, we're jumping to different characters that we focus on for a brief period of time. Linton Davies also says that montage is often seen to be where editors are most free to be creative to ignore certain laws of continuity in order to prioritize feeling and emotion. What do we mean by montage? Montage is when you have all these various shots um, of all these different characters in all these different spaces, and they are lined up, we could say juxtaposed, against each other. They're lined up against each other to create a sense of cohesion. Like we have to think about the individual shots at the beginning of Contagion um, are, if, if they weren't aligned together, wouldn't give us the same sense that we derive from them. We are witnessing the birth of this pandemic. We are seeing it happen and we become aware through the way that the editor has place these images together of how this narrative is progressing, even though what we're getting is, is seemingly random information. Like at first, I think it's, it's fairly jarring when we move from Gwyneth Paltrow to uh, the young man to the young lady who's a model. And we might be going, well, where is this all going? Am I supposed to be following any one of these characters? Because we're used to, I think, in film and in conventional fiction narrative, following one character. And so the beginning of this film is a bit jarring because we're not really sure who the protagonist is. Who are we supposed to be following? Gwyneth Paltrow was the first person on the screen. So we might assume it's her, but then we get this barrage of faces and uh, and that becomes challenging. But then, you know, those faces are dead shortly after. And we're given this information in a visual way, um, but it is supported by the sound. The sound, uh, sound in film is music. Obviously we get this um, intense, somewhat discordant, electronic soundtrack that gives us a sense of unease. And you have to think about, you know, the shot of Gwyneth Paltrow hugging her son, hugging, you know, hugging the, the, the character who's playing, the, the actor who's playing her son. And that if we put different music over the top of that, this could be, you know, I don't know, a commercial for life insurance or something like that. Something, something at least not, not quite as dark. Maybe in life insurance was the wrong, <laughs> the wrong choice for a metaphor there. But w this could be a, a happy family film if we just change the music up over that shot. But when you pair that shot with that really um, bizarre tonal movement, that nee -nee -nee thing that happens at that point, uh, we... Are, are, are kind of freaked out. And I think especially as people who have lived now through a pandemic, watching people touch in film, you know, can freak us out. My wife and I frequently, when we're watching movies now, we'll be like, oh, too close, too close. You know? And here's a mother hugging her child after she's come home from an overseas trip. And those of us who have lived through COVID are going like, you need to isolate. You need to get away from your son. But we, you know, even before the pandemic, the film has given us enough information through that editing sequence, through that montage to understand that she is probably like the other people who have died and is coming home with this disease. And in hugging her son, she's just communicated it. And so this heartwarming moment of homecoming is sheer horror. Steven Soderbergh said that this, he's the director of the film. Steven Soderbergh said that this movie was his horror film. And there are a lot of techniques that are, are ported over from horror. We don't ever get an on-screen monster. The virus is invisible. But the camera shows us where it is. The camera's pointing to where it is. And the sound helps us recognize when transmission is occurring in this particular case. The music also acts as what's called a sound bridge. It moves it moves us between these shots without us feeling like there is discordance, that the narrative is broken up. The narrative is absolutely broken up through the process of editing, but sound smooths that over and makes us feel like we're watching something that has a cohesive whole. 
There are other aspects to sound too. There's natural and artificial sound. Sometimes they take what they record on the set on location. Other times uh, the dialogue is recorded afterwards um, and the, the actors have to match that up to their original performance. That's increasingly common. And then uh, silence is also really a part of sound because the dynamic of a film can be enhanced by silence. If there's a really intense uh, period of, of sound and noise followed by silence, it makes us wake up. It makes us sit up and, and take notice. Same thing if there's a moment of silence followed by a really intense uh, moment of sound. If you've ever seen the movie A Quiet Place, you'll know what that feels like. Um, but that dynamic is part of how sound is used in film. And we want to understand two other concepts about film sound at this point, which is that there is diegetic sound, which is sound within the cinematic story world, the dialogue, the things that the characters can actually hear, sound effects. So if a door closes and we hear the click, uh, or the sound of the guy on the other end of the phone when Gwyneth Paltrow is talking in the airport. Um, that's all diegetic. It's in the cinematic story world. The characters can hear it. And then there's non-diegetic sound, like the music, the score, the soundtrack. The actors cannot hear that most of the time. I want to say that they. I don't want to say that they never hear that because we're going to find an instance later in our semester when this is not the case. So here, though, there is a clear, a clear. Uh, delineation between diegetic and non-diegetic sound. And again, we get those, 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 um, those sound bridges. And sound bridges work with editing to enhance our experience of the film. This wonderful shot, I don't want to say it's wonderful because, you know, there's this young lady who's died because of contact with the flu. And that is edited with the people from her community back home and she's gotten on a bus and she's traveled which means we know as the 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 audience that the flu has traveled we are visually seeing the flu on the move we're seeing the virus travel and then we get this voiceover of not so much non-diegetic sound because it is inside the cinematic story world but it's not inside the diegesis of what we're seeing on the screen that's somewhere else. The, 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 the person who's trying to wake up the young lady on the bus, the people who are treating the potential victims of the virus in that community do not hear the line, how are we defining contained? And it's that, again, it's that juxtaposition of all of these elements that tells us a story with intense rapidity with intense, um, like there, there is a, there's a, a simultaneity to the information that we're getting. And if we're paying close attention to a film and not doing what most of us do, which is, you know, we spend time on our phone and we go and we get snacks and maybe we're ironing some clothes or we're folding laundry or we're doing something else while we're watching a film. We're not really watching a movie. We're probably just listening to half of it and seeing the rest. We occasionally look up when some stuff's going on. But this sort of really well-made film requires our full attention to catch everything that that movie is doing. And with Contagion, we have a really well-wrought film. This is a very well-made movie. Whether you like it or not, this is a well-made movie. Um, and we can see it in, the, in, in these moments of artistry, of placing how are we defining contained over, as it were, these images that clearly demonstrate that the, that containment has not occurred, that, that, that the virus is not contained. And so there's this positioning of a statement through it, and it's a sound bridge. It flows over the edits, and it, and, and it, it lends greater meaning to the images that we're seeing on the screen without it having to be sort of a very clunky uh, voiceover you know, some narrator saying, and then the virus wasn't contained. No, we just, we go, oh, it's not contained, right? Uh, other sound bridges include the awful noise of uh, the instrument that they use to cut open Gwyneth Paltrow's skull during the autopsy. That sound bridge is just the worst. Um, and it's an amazing scene in that there really isn't 
you know, we don't really see a ton of what goes on there, but it's very disquieting and it's sound that achieves that. Quite often, if, if we know somebody's going to get, you know, hit with a, a terrible weapon, like a chainsaw or an ax, um, we don't have to see it happen. We just need to hear it happen. And that is oftentimes worse because our imagination goes into overdrive. I've had students who are like, I had to tap out at the autopsy scene. I couldn't go further than that. And I think sound has a lot to do with that. The sound, not only of the, 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 uh, the instrument that cuts the, the head open, but then peeling back the uh, flesh, the skin, uh, uh, to get at the skull and the brain. So very disquieting uh, through the use of sound. But uh, we, we know at this point, and this isn't very far into the film, that Gwyneth Paltrow's dead. And Gwyneth Paltrow was a big name when Contagion came out. She's on the poster. And so I think as an audience, we would come into uh, the theater thinking, oh, well, she's, she's the first person we see, so she's probably the protagonist. Maybe she has the flu, but maybe they're going to be able to contain it. And then we get this shocking scene where she just dies. She just dies. And if you'd seen the trailer, you might think, oh, no, she's going to make it. We, we get her in flashback for the remainder of the film. So she does get a lot of screen time, but she's dead very early on. And I think it's a way for the film to say, we are serious about this. Paltrow's performance is wonderful. I, and and I, I like using Gwyneth Paltrow as an example of acting and the embodied performance because actors are also celebrities. And so for them to be able to distance themselves from their off-screen persona, and Lord knows, uh, you know, with Gwyneth Paltrow and some of the things that she's been, you know, <laughs> advocating for and selling in the past few years, um, we have to see what she does here as pure performance, that this is not Gwyneth Paltrow. Rather, this is the character that she embodies in this particular film. Though that's difficult for us once we have actors who have achieved a certain level of celebrity. But there are ways in which filmmakers can use that celebrity to their advantage. And I think Steven Soderbergh does here because he's like, oh, you couldn't imagine I'd kill off America's sweetheart, would you? Ha! And I did it. And he does uh, you know, it's like what Alfred Hitchcock did in Psycho by taking the character that everyone thought was the leading lady, the, the protagonist. And she really was the leading lady in that film. It's just it, Hitchcock killed her off before the movie was long before the movie is, is over. So there's a very similar move being utilized here where you're playing on audience assumptions. Audience is going, I know how much Gwyneth Paltrow makes for a movie. I know how much we love Gwyneth Paltrow. They won't kill her. Yes, they will. And what that says early in the film is all bets are off. And yet what we usually focus on when we focus on acting is what we think of as their performance and whether or not it matches our expectations of what a real person would do, of what we would do. And those aren't necessarily part of what's going on with that performance. These are not real people. They are actors embodying a, a character. And again, you know, we get that look of shock in, in, in the, in the, in the paratexts for this film, uh, the, the posters in, and, and they had individual posters for each of the, um, the major players and Gwyneth Paltrow got hers. So you would think if you saw that on a billboard and you saw it all over the place that she was going to make it. And then St Soderbergh pulls the rug out from under you. And that consequently means that when he gets around to killing off Kate Winslet, uh, we're not, we're, we're still, I think we're still gutted by it because we have come to um, sympathize, empathize, identify with her character potentially. We certainly want her to win. We want her to defeat the virus. And she's so, she's so brave. Um, and yet the film says, no, she's, she, she's contracted the, 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 the virus. And we're sort of prepared for it because of, of how Gwyneth Paltrow exits the film. So there are ways in which acting is absolutely about performance, but there are also ways in which acting can be about leveraging celebrity to mess with audience expectations. Cinematography, as I said earlier, is about capturing the performances and the look of the film. This is how we, as the audience, get to see what the actors did, what the production design team did. 
Um, it's and it, but it's not just about setting a camera up and pressing go, and that'll just that'll create the magic. You've got the best actor in the world, and you don't position them well in the frame of the shot. It's not going to be as good as it could have been. And I know this from personal experience growing up with uh, a video camera and a desire to be a filmmaker. And my friends and I would get together and we'd make movies. And what we'd do is we'd just set the camera up and then we'd run into the shot and we'd, we'd have swords or whatever. We would do kung fu moves and we would have some sort of combat. And then I'd go back and I'd look at the footage and it always looked terrible. It didn't look at all like what I thought it was, what it's going to look like in my head. Because while the combat was going on, I was like, oh, that was so cool. And oh, look at what he just did. And the problem was, is that I wasn't framing any of those shots well. I was shooting this from like a, a sort of medium shot where we were all in the frame. But what, what, those, what those, those moments of action really needed was for me to heft that camera on my shoulder and get right up close to where my friends were engaged in these combat moments and then cut that all together later on. You can have the best performance in the world, but if the camera doesn't capture it well, it won't be as good as it could have been. And so absolutely acting matters in a film, but cinematography matters more. Because if you can't capture the moment, you don't have a film at all. And if you can't capture it well, you don't have as good a film. So cinematography is about the camera, the, 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 the lens of the camera being our narrator. It narrates the film. And the angles it uses tell us something about the nature of this particular film. The cinematography in Contagion works from a style of film called Cinema Verite, which was all the rage in the 1970s. George Lucas even used it in Star Wars. And it, it, it's, a, it's a way of making a film feel more real. It is a technique by which we can decrease the way in which a film is a contrivance. A film is always a bit of a lie. Even a documentary film is a bit of a lie in that there's always a camera there. There are edits. They leave some things out. They include the things that matter most to the narrative that they want to craft. That's not me being a conspiracy theorist and saying don't trust documentaries. It's just me saying that there's always a bit of contrivance going on um, with film. And... But, but Steven Soderbergh wants us to feel like this is really happening. Now, how can he get the camera to support that? He does it by placing the camera as though it, it's us, like, peeking around the corner and observing these people's lives. The shot of Matt Damon in the back of the car is framed by the front seats of the vehicle. Now, they can build rigs for shooting scenes in cars where they just take the front seats out completely, put the camera rig in place, and you have a conversation in the back seat of a car that has no seats in front. You have no seats blocking any part of the view, but the seats are in the way as that note of cinema verite. Same thing with the conversation between Marianne Cotillard and uh, her, her, um, her contact, seen through glass. Seen as though we're in the next office over as though we just happened to be passing by and now we're like listening in on this conversation. A shot of Lawrence Fishburne, his character talking to uh, his fiance and there's this, there's this printer in the, in the, in the foreground and uh, you know, stacks of paper and whatnot. And the camera is just behind those. Again, it's like we're listening in, we're looking in from the side and checking out what's going on. Cinematography in this film is absolutely fantastic, and I'm not talking about that in a sort of like, wasn't it pretty kind of way, but rather in a wasn't the camera an amazing narrator. In the way that it was constantly showing us the surfaces that people were touching, right? The door, the doorknobs and whatnot. This movie makes doorknobs terrifying. <laughs> Any surface that you would touch. And that brings us into, uh, into the, the next uh, piece of cinema, cinematic language mise-en-scene. Again, 
that's a French term. It's used widely in film studies. And so rather than just reduce that to production design, I'm going to keep saying mise-en-scene and you should practice saying it too, uh, because then you'll find it easier to say, even if the first few times you, you stumble over it. Uh, and, and as I say that, that translated directly just sort of means put into the scene, everything that gets put into the scene, the props, the costumes, um, it's the setting of the film, uh, but it's also the lighting, um, so cinematography and mise-en-scene, real, there's a real blending and blurring of those. Um, and mise-en-scene provides the film with its total environment with a wealth of visual detail. But when we combine that with good cinematography, we can tell the story without having to go, look, the virus is on the portfolio that she just put down on the table. We will piece that together. You know, we've got this model, she's got her portfolio, she starts feeling sick, she puts the portfolio down, she leaves, she's dead in the next shot, thanks to the magic of editing. And cinematography and mise-en-scene have helped us get there because we get this very, very black portfolio on a very, very white table. That is not incidental. It is not accidental. That is a good production designer saying, okay, we need this to stand out, but we don't want to telegraph it in a really garish way. And so everything about this shot has a sort of blend of these blacks and lighter colors but the table is far lighter than the portfolio. And so our eye focuses on it. The camera gets us to look there by, by, by pointing us in that direction. And so again, mise-en-scene can be absolutely fantastic. You can have the greatest set design ever. And if you listen to audio commentaries for DVDs or Blu-rays, you will sometimes hear production designers complaining that the film didn't get their best work into a shot because maybe it wasn't relevant or maybe they didn't have a very good cinematographer. Put these things all together and you get moments like Matt Damon as, as, as Mitch Emhoff coming into this supermarket with his daughter and we've got mise-en-scene. We've got production design having stripped the shelves, but they're a very particular type of shelf. This is not a Tony neighborhood. This is not a neighborhood with big money. This is like a low end uh, local grocery store. They don't have big money. They are, they are not the haves in America. Uh, most of the shelves are bare and the scene is lit in a way that has a sort of bluish tone, which gives us a sense of cold um, and when we have that sense of cold, we have a sense of disquiet. If you want to shoot a really great romantic moment, you probably don't want this color palette <laughs> for the big kiss. You want that to be warm and the light to be diffuse. And that's not what we get here. We have a sense of things being disturbing. Now, the way that the frame is, the, the shot is framed also makes, um, the actors very small in that very narrow corridor. And there's, there's a sense of, of things closing in. There's a sense of foreboding. This is meant to make us feel uncomfortable. And the actors sell that further, right? And the soundtrack at this point is telling us that this is not a good place to be. We can hear the sounds of um, people just stealing stuff. There's chaos in the background. And so this all coalesces to show us the experience that they have of going to the grocery store. Now, we contrast that with Aubrey's experience in this really nice grocery store where she just goes up and she picks nice things off the, 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 the shelves, which are all full as well. Even look at the color palette again. It's warm color palette. It's not cold. It's not blue. It's got the, the, the reds and oranges. Um, this place feels like a supermarket that, you know, you want to go and shop at. She's doing it very leisurely. Her performance demonstrates to us that she is in no danger, not like, not like, uh, Mitch and his daughter are. So her performance tells us something about that. And again, editing puts these together in some way that we can, we can contrast and, and compare. Um, it's not a perfect cross cutting thing. We're not shifting back and forth between these. The movie isn't going to do that because it's trying hard to retain that sense of, of realism. 
um, but we don't get any we don't get any intense action music at this point of the film either. And I, I use these as examples of how it all comes together to get us warmed up to talk about how that compares with Station Eleven. Because all these grocery store scenes are a moment of what we call intertextuality. It's also called intermediality, and it would probably be more accurate for us to use the term intermediality, but I want us to go with intertextuality because it shows up more in the study of narrative. Intertextuality is a term popularized by Julia Kristeva, which refers to, and here I'm quoting from Abram, Abrams and Harpum's glossary of literary terms, refers to, intertextuality refers to the multiple ways in which any one literary text is in fact made up of other texts by means of its open or covert citations and allusions. Open or covert citations and allusions. That's intertextuality. The multiple ways in which any one, let's say narrative, instead of text, let's say narrative, because then we get to include contagion. We might think of a text, and sometimes I'll use text in that way, a very, very sort of broad way of using the term text. I might talk about the film text. I'm not talking about the screenplay. I'm just talking about the, the narrative of the film when we view it close up. So let's just say any one narrative is in fact made up of other narratives by means of its open or covert citations and allusions. What does that mean? How it references them. How one narrative references other narratives. Either by openly saying, I'm referencing it, like at the beginning of Station Eleven, Arthur Leander is in a performance of King Lear, Shakespeare's King Lear. So we have an open citation slash allusion to King Lear in that reference. And it's interesting to consider King Lear. Why is King why King Lear? Why not some other Shakespeare play? Is it just Mandel's favorite Shakespeare play? Or is it perhaps, and this was interesting to me when I was looking for images for the slides for this lecture, and I found uh, pictures of Ian McKellen playing Lear, we note that his initial costume is well put together, you know, sense of uh, very regal king. Uh, to it, and then his later costume, mise en scène, as it were, is rags. It's dirty. It's messy. It's not regal anymore. And there is a sense in which using Lear as an intertextual move allows Mandel, potentially, maybe she didn't mean this at all, but it's just something I've picked up on, to give us a Shakespeare text that has a before and an after. Before Lear goes mad, after Lear goes mad. Apocalypse, post-apocalypse. At the personal level, not at the great big global level. But intertextuality also is about co covert citations and allusions. And covert citations, unlike open citations, like we openly allude to something, we make it clear we're making that allusion. Arthur Leander in King Lear, open citation slash allusion. All these moments in the grocery stores feels more like a covert citation or allusion. Now, it doesn't, Mendel didn't need to mean for us to make these comparisons. Kristeva's idea of intertextuality is simply that once we start comparing different narratives that include the same content, we begin to understand those narratives better. We've got this quote from Station Eleven where Mandel writes that Jeevan's understanding of disaster preparedness was based entirely on action movies, but on the other hand, he'd seen a lot of action movies. That's not a open citation to a particular film, but it is an open citation to types of films, to films where things have gone south, and you have to get ready for whatever's coming. And so there's Jeevan getting ready in a little supermarket to stock up on food and necessities for him and his brother. And Mandel gives us an open 
citation to action movies, but she doesn't tell us which ones. And she doesn't really need to because there, there are so many instances in film of the grocery store scene, the, get it, the disaster preparedness scene. World War Z, Brad Pitt and his family end up in a supermarket early in the film to get some necessities. We just, you know, we've, we, we, we just looked at the moments from Contagion. This is a frequently used sequence in apocalyptic narratives. The let's pack up and get ready to go scene. And if you take it and you set it in a store, then you can add looting and the, the danger of other people. And so this isn't a open citation to the film World War Z. Rather, it's an open citation to the sort of moment that happens in those scenes. We have to think about how the moments in, and we'll go back to the film that, that you know, my students have watched, to Contagion. Even within Contagion, we get contrast between Mitch's perspective, Mitch's point of view, and Aubrey's point of view. Mitch's situation is far more frantic. It's far more harried. There's more danger. He goes around the corner and a woman coughs in his face. He turns around and tells his daughter to drop whatever she's got and leave. And as they leave, they see people looting and, 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 and there's crime going on and stuff. You know, and they, they, they run away. Whereas Aubrey seems pretty chill as she's getting ready to flee the city because she's been given this information in advance, right? The film contrasts those, and if we contrast them, we understand something more about those characters. But we can likewise make these comparisons with Station Eleven. Which of the two experiences, Mitch and Aubrey's, is um, Jeevan's more like? Incidentally, within a year or two, we'll be able to make these comparisons using actual footage. So Station Eleven is being uh, produced as a series for HBO Max, and Himesh Patel has been uh, attached to the role of Jeevan. And, and at that point, we'll be able to look at it from a perfectly cinematic viewpoint. But here, we're doing a little bit of intermedial, intertextual investigation. It'll still be intermedial and intertextual, even after even after we have a film version of Station Eleven, because we could say, "Hey, how is the film version different from the book?" Um, but in this case, we just we have these contrasts. Which of these moments in Contagion is Jeevan's experience in the novel more like, or is it potentially a blending? of those things. And once we begin to ask those questions, rather than just saying like what our initial reaction is to the book, like if we've never read an apocalyptic narrative, then we may find Station Eleven to be super intense. A real page turner really had me on the edge of my seat. Whereas for somebody like me, I read The Stand by Stephen King when I was like 13 or 14. And so you know, and I've watched a lot of apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic movies. So for me, Station Eleven didn't feel very intense. We want to get another literary term into your, into your basket of goodies, into your skill set, where we don't just talk about point of view, because point of view can sometimes be the narrator's point of view. We want to consider something in um, narrative theory called focalization. And we want to consider Jeevan as the focalizer for the narration of the theater. And once we do that, that can help us to understand, once again, how Station Eleven is different from a narrative like Contagion. Mitch Emhoff is the focalizer. Even though the camera is the, is the, is the narrator, for any of the sequences in Contagion. Mitch is ultimately the focalizer for the death of his wife. He sees her go into that seizure initially. They rush him out of the room. The camera remains there, but 
the viewpoint, the focalization of that scene has us right there in the hospital with Mitch. Contrast that with Jeevan's experience in Station Eleven. Is he ever in the hospital with Hua? No. He's on the phone with his friend Hua. Hua's like, hey, this is all going down. Hua is where Gwyneth Paltrow is dying. Not legitimately. I mean, these are not, this is not some sort of shared MCU universe. But Hua is in that situation. But Mandel doesn't focalize the action through Hua. She focalizes the action through Jeevan. And Focalizing the action through Jeevan places us distance, gives us distance from the horrific moments of this pandemic. We don't see people die from the Georgia flu in Station Eleven. There, there, I, I, I struggle to think of a an extended, explicit scene in Station Eleven where someone dies horribly from the Georgia flu. We learn that they do, but we're never front and center for it. Not like Mitch is front and center for the death of his wife. And that's important because you can say, well, the same actions happen in both, in both works. Yeah, but how are they focalized? How are they different? Once we've got the intertextual concept going and we can recognize that there are similarities, we say, oh, these are both telling the same story or they both have the same story elements. But then I need to say, okay, but how are they different as narratives? How are these narratives specifically telling that story? And in the case of Jeevan's experience in Station Eleven, we have him, you have to think about it, if, it, if there was mise-en-scene to be considered in Station Eleven, and there, there is setting the way that Emily St. John Mandel writes about it, the way that she describes snow falling on Toronto, and Jeevan walking through a park. It's picturesque. It's beautiful. And is Jeevan freaking out about the plague for most of the theater? No. Jeevan is going through a personal apocalypse. He's thinking about breaking up with his girlfriend. And he's thinking about starting over. He's thinking about, you know, going into uh, being in, like an EMT. He wants to be someone who helps people who are uh, hurt. He wants, to, he wants to make his life matter. And we are there as the reader for this epiphany in Jeevan's life. Students will say, well, but Jeevan, you know, used to have panic attacks. Hua talks about that. But does Jeevan have a panic attack in the theater? No, he, he stays pretty cool. And when you think about him loading up his, his groceries, it's not this intense, frantic moment. It's him walking around and choosing stuff. And yeah, he's thinking about how things are going to go down. But he doesn't have a sense that the world is really ending yet. He just knows he needs to go and take care of his brother. Now, we might as the reader, but that's different than our focalizer knowing those things. And if you go back and you take a look at the way that Emily St. John Mandel has crafted Jeevan's narrative, uh, has crafted the, the theater as an opening, focalizing most of it through Jeevan, then we can understand why Maximilian Feldner would say that Station Eleven presents an unusually optimistic and hopeful vision of an otherwise bleak future in Station Eleven. We're going to continue to investigate this idea of story and narrative, of intertextuality, both open and covert, next week by comparing the prologue to Stephen King's The Stand with, once again, The Theater by Station Eleven. So if you've already read that first part of Station Eleven, you're good. You just need to read the prologue to Stephen King's The Stand. And if you're like, I don't own a copy of Stephen King's The Stand, that's okay. Amazon's got your back. Just go read the preview for uh, The Stand on on Amazon. The, the preview will get you through the prologue and you'll, you'll be on the same page uh, as the rest of us, as me and the rest of us. Uh, so thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next time 
on Triple Bladed Soar.